What if we had a glimpse of the future back in January of 2020? We would have had a vaccine ready and waiting for when the attack came. We probably could have avoided being in a pandemic today. As of February 9th, 2021, the World Health Organization reported 106.1 million confirmed cases, 2.3 million confirmed deaths in 223 countries or territories with the cases of coronavirus. A year after the original, we have variants. What if that number was zero? If we had known about this virus, we would have had procedures in place. We probably would have had a vaccine ready just in case people were traveling to other parts of the world. And at this church, Uma would have been at the door with a list of names and she would have had vaccinated, non-vaccinated. And as you came in, she would check your names off and if you were not vaccinated, we'd have a nurse at a booth waiting for you to get your shot and then you can enter. Wouldn't that have been great? Oh, the power of a glimpse of the future. Now picture this for a moment. You're walking on a trail through bamboo patches in the Caribbean and you get to a spot where you see rays of sun piercing through to reveal a waterfall. And the water reflects the sunlight. And you are in a moment of bliss and peace. And you are struck with the magnificence of it. And you say to yourself, this was created by the divine. Today is Transfiguration Sunday, and we will be looking at the scripture passage from Matthew 17, verses 1 to 9. It is also Valentine's Day, and how fitting it is to talk about the greatest love story ever told, the love that Jesus Christ has for us, that he sacrificed his life for us. Matthew 17, 1 to 9. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elisha, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here if you wish. I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. When he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified, but Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. In the Gospel of Matthew, there are questions of who is Jesus? Who are we? Who does Jesus say he is? Once revealed, how do we prepare for the future? Crucifixion must be recontextualized by Jesus' glory. The disciples got a glimpse of how Jesus will look after his death, resurrection, and ascension. People are speculating that this Jesus is John the Baptist, come back to life, or reborn. 
maybe Elijah or one of the prophets. After receiving Peter's confession of his identity as Messiah, the son of the living God, and after the first prediction of his suffering and resurrection, Jesus directs his earthly ministry towards the final preparation of his disciples for the impeding weeks, events of Passion Week. Matthew tells us that Jesus and his disciples left Galilee and went up to the villages near Caesarea Philippi. And as they were walking along, Jesus asked him, Who do people say I am? People answered, without hesitation, that Jesus is the Messiah in 1616. Jesus' claims went well beyond those of any other teacher of his day. Not only did he identify himself as the Messiah in the Old Testament, it was predicted in Luke 24, 44, but he also brazenly claimed to be God in John 10, 30. Time and time again, he authenticated this claim to deity by performing miracles, acts that no mere man could ever do. The transfiguration, however, was more than just another display of Jesus' miraculous abilities. This laid bare his divine essence. The transfiguration account begins with a chronological note. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up to a high mountain to be alone. This mountain is not identified in the Bible. Now, traditionally, Mount Tabor has been favored, but Matthew seems to imply the mountain is outside of Galilee, so most scholars favor Mount Hermon. Jesus and his disciples have been in the region of Caesarea Philippi, and this mountain is immediately accessible. It is the most majestic peak in the region, at 9,166 feet high. The number six is significant and parallels the story of creation when God created the universe in six days and rested on the seventh. Six represents a period of work. The transfiguration has some parallels with Moses' ascent and descent of Mount Sinai. In Matthew 17, 1, Jesus takes three disciples up to the mountain. In Exodus 24, Moses goes with three named persons plus 70 of the elders up to the mountain. In Matthew 17, 2, Jesus is transfigured and his clothes become radiantly white. In Exodus 34, 29, Moses' skin shines when he descends from the mountain after talking with God. Today we are going to look at three things in this passage. We are going to look at the glory, the witnesses, and the cloud. Jesus took three disciples, Peter, James, and John, featured prominently in the gospel. These three were the first called, as recorded, and their names had the list of the twelve. They belonged to Jesus in a circle. During the darkest hours in Gethsemane, Jesus takes these three with him to pray when he separates himself from the other disciples. They belong to his inner circle. They were his close friends. In verse 2-3, we hear, As the man watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed. So his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. And in that moment on that mountain, omnipresent God, full of wisdom, magnificence, glory, enters Jesus and Jesus becomes whiter than you can ever imagine. Now can you imagine the shock on Peter's, James and John's face? They were terrified. The white flash of splendor 
comes to brighten the dark cloud of tribulation and confirms Jesus' promise that those who follow and suffer for him will not have done so in vain. Now, this vision is similar to the vision John wrote in Revelation 1.16 when he wrote to the seven churches in Asia. He got the vision from the angel sent by Christ and he saw his face was like the sun in all its brightness. And here on the mount, the disciples were frightened. Just before going up into the mountain, Jesus predicts his death in Matthew 16, 21 to 28. And Peter pulled Jesus aside and reprimanded him because he didn't understand what Jesus was saying. And Jesus said to him, get away from me, Satan. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God. Now, this is the same Peter Jesus took up to the mountain. Remember, in the next few days to come, Peter, James, and John were going to see this same beloved Jesus rejected, battered, bruised as he was mocked, beaten, and nailed to the cross. Jesus told them of the torture that was to come when that crown of thorns would be put on his head. The pain and agony that would challenge their belief and dim their light. And now God is saying to them, look, look what lies ahead. Look what is to come. They needed to know that this Jesus was not only human, but divine. For a brief moment, the disciples glimpsed the truth as the divine glory shines through the veil of suffering. The disciples needed this vision before that lengthy journey to the cross. One scholar says, the purpose of God's action in transforming Jesus in this way is to show the disciples what is actually the case. Namely, Jesus' divine sonship. Now, this precious moment in time was beyond comprehension for them. Something they were yet to discover. The transfiguration, therefore, serves to confirm that the suffering is in Jesus' future. But... The Father's honor, glory, and power are his as well. This scene functions as a hologram. We need to have this vision as we go through this pandemic. We need to know what lies ahead when we accept Jesus as our Savior and Lord. We have been given a glimpse of the future. Now, secondly, the witnesses. Not only did they see Jesus in the divine, they saw Elijah and Moses, two men from the Old Testament. Moses and Elijah were great men. Now, this is the same Moses God entrusted with the laws in the Old Testament, whose skin shines when he descends from the mountain after speaking with God. The relationship you have with God in this life is the relationship you will have with God in the next. You can have a relationship of faith and obedience through Jesus Christ or a relationship of unbelief and rebellion. The Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes 11.3, as the tree falls, so shall it lie. As a man lives, so shall he die. And as a man dies, so shall he be through all the eons of eternity. Secondly, 
God caused the disciples to know the identity of these two great prophets, even though they had never met them. Now, we don't know if they had seen images of them before, but when they showed up on that mountain, Peter, James, and John knew who they were. And thirdly, we learn here that it is possible to share in Christ's glory after death. Just like Moses and Elijah shared in his glory at that moment on the mountain. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul tells us that he called you to salvation when we told you the good news. Now you can share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. God has given us a glimpse of the future so we can experience the glory of God. So Jesus gives his disciples that glimpse, a glimpse of the glory, a glimpse of hope, the hope that is to come after the crucifixion. Now the cloud. The transfiguration of Jesus confuses and terrifies his disciples. And Peter is eager to build some memorials, three memorials, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for Jesus, because this is all he can comprehend. But then God intervenes, and God said, God said, wait, 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 hold on, guys. This is my son. This is my son. Listen to him. Can you imagine God in all his majesty and glory and authority saying to Peter, James, and John, listen to my son. Forget everything else. No human eye has ever seen him, this great God, nor will they ever will. All honor and power to him forever. Matthew 17, 5 tells us about the cloud that came. Now God wants us to be reconciled with him, but through his son, Jesus Christ. For the Bible says, he is in charge. Listen to him. In the Gospel of John, when Jesus was talking to his disciples about his betrayal and denial, Thomas said, We have no idea where you are going, Lord. And how can we know the way? But Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to me. No one can come to the Father except through me. Matthew 7 continues. Now the disciples were scared. This great majestic God had just burst through the clouds and, and they were afraid. And Jesus came over to them and touched them. And Jesus said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I am here for you. Now, can you imagine the relief in Peter, James, and John when Jesus laid his hands on them and touched them? Jesus is saying, there is no fear. There is no fear of the Father because I am here. I am here to protect you. They had seen a glimpse of the future. The transfiguration not only confirms Jesus' status as God's beloved son, but underlines with disruptive splendor God's affirmation of Jesus' way of the cross. As Jesus stands alongside Moses and Elijah, his word about the cross stands alongside the law and the prophets. He is the new way. This is in the fulfillment of the prophecy in Deuteronomy 18.15 when Moses said, 
the Lord your God will rise up for you a prophet like me from among your fellow Israelites. In all the terror of the presence of God, Jesus touched his disciples and he took away their fear. As human beings, we all have fear and disbelief in the face of truths that are outside our experience, outside our norms, outside what we fervently want to happen. During this pandemic, we are faced with loneliness, the inability to visit loved ones who are sick, the inability to pay respects to the death of loved ones. We have become a community of homebodies. These are the truths we have to accept. Christians understand that despite the sometimes hard to face truths that are inherent in being human, we have a glimpse of the future and the promise of eternal life. And that glimpse was revealed to us on that mountaintop when human and divine touched each other. The blinding truth that Jesus is telling the disciples is, hey, listen, here's what is in store for you. A life of bliss, joy, and peace awaits. Now, every two years or so, my family vacations in Trinidad. We go to visit relatives in Trinidad. And we go to visit a beach called Maracas Beach. You have to drive up a mountain and then down the mountain to get there. And as we drive up the mountain, there is this place called the Lookout. And from the Lookout, you can see the clear blue water and the waves and the white sand that awaits you. And you get a, a taste of the warm breeze against your skin. And not for a moment will you think of turning back. Do you know how many people have ever turned back? Correct. None. Zero. Why would you? If that is what awaits, why would you turn back? Now that we have been given a glimpse of the future in the transfiguration, what is the plan? Through Christ, you can know this God and you can stand in his presence. After God had spoken to them, Elijah and Moses were gone. The cloud disappeared and only Jesus in human form was with them. Now, how do you think they descended that mountain? Very, very different from when they ascended. That's for sure. Jesus instructed them not to tell anyone until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Now, they were still confused, but they were no longer terrified. Our individual timelines between birth and death can transport us to several mountaintops theophanies. Now, we are fighting many battles today, and we are fighting for this pandemic to be over and for enough vaccines to go around the world. We are fighting for these first world countries to see the injustice in claiming all the vaccines while the poorer countries have none. We are fighting for the well-being of those who are ill, for those who are battling mental health, and those who are facing other social injustices. And how can we fight to overcome these battles. We can fight by showing our love, care, compassion, and by trusting. 
just as Jesus trusted his disciples when he revealed himself on that mountaintop. Jesus trusts that we will follow his example of love, compassion, and humility and fight for a true relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ so that we can experience that future now that we have been given a glimpse. How do we prepare for that? Here are a few things we can do. We can have faith that God is real and God is listening to us. Have faith that Jesus loves you and Jesus wants to take care of you. Have faith that we serve a risen Christ and we have a promise of eternal life. Have faith that there is nothing to fear when Jesus is near. Now, one may ask, and how are we going to build that faith? Now, we can build that faith by reading the Bible, prayer, meditation, over the past few weeks, Pastor Jeff has been giving us a plan to read the Bible. And we said, start with the Gospel of John, read the New Testament, and then read the rest of the Bible. Now, today is the perfect day to start because we have had a glimpse of the future. As we approach the Easter season, I am putting out a challenge to you. Commit 15 minutes to read the Bible and pray every morning. Now, I'm saying morning, but you can pick your time. I challenge you to take 15 minutes of this 24-hour day and devote that to God. Take a few verses and let it settle and let it form within you. And if you are not on Pastor Jeff's email to get his reflection every week, fill out the connection card at stpaulsnobleton.ca connect and he will add you to that list. Secondly, Share God's word. When your faith grows, it becomes easy to share God's word. Now, God calls us to be something bigger than ourselves. And we can build God's kingdom by passing it on. The Apostle Paul compared the building of God's kingdom to growing a garden. Now, for those of you who know me, knows that I love to garden. Some of us can plant seeds. Some of us can water. And some of us can go and weed the garden. We are, as Paul said, co-workers in God's service in 1 Corinthians. And you can share God's word by talking to people by sharing our daily bread booklets, by sending a small note to someone, or sharing your gift of music. Now, there are a few things you can do right here with us at St. Paul's, and they're all online. You can join our Life Connect group on Tuesday mornings at 9.30 a.m., or you can join our Good News group on Thursdays at noon, or, as we heard this morning, you can join our Alpha program on Wednesday nights at 7.30 p.m. So there is no excuse. Thirdly, live a life that will bring honor and glory to God. And how do we do that? We can live according to the fruits of the Spirit. We can show love, spread joy, be peaceful, show kindness, goodness, be faithful, be gentle, and 
exercise self-control. Now Jesus is calling every one of you to come to know him personally so that when you face the almighty God you will not be afraid because Jesus will be right there. When you build your faith you work in God's garden and you can pick your role. Will you be one who plants the seeds? Will you be one who waters? Or will you be one who goes out to the garden and pull out the weeds? Now that we have been given a glimpse of the future, let us prepare. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Dear Jesus, we thank you for revealing your true divine nature to us on the mountaintops. We thank you for the witnesses present there, and we thank you that you have given us a glimpse of the future. We thank you for the promise of eternal life. O oh, Jesus, shine and fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze, and set our hearts on fire to worship and praise your name. Help us to go stronger in faith and give us the courage to proclaim your word. O oh, great Redeemer, take hold of us and draw us closer to you. Guide us with all your wisdom and inside, so we will find ways to reach out to each other in support and friendship. And open our eyes to opportunities to reach out beyond our own fellowship as agents of your healing and hope. All this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.